So hello, everyone, again. Uh, so I, rest, I write in Rust a day, and at night, I'm thinking about how to bring P2P networks and web closer together. And today, I want to talk about WebRTC. WebRTC is an HTML5 technology that's been available since at least year 2012. And it's currently stabilized as a standard, but it's, all, uh, it's not currently stabilized as a standard, but it's already available as a draft, and it's uh, usable today. It's, uh, this won't be a talk about intricate technical details of WebRTC. And this talk is not only about WebRTC per se, it's about what's possible and what changes WebRTC might bring and at first, I thought about giving, uh, to give you more practical examples and about um, more details about the structure of the centralized networks. But then I thought that technology in isolation is not that important. Because every technology serves a purpose. We don't make things just to make things usually, right? So I want to give you a broader perspective on this technology. And uh, because I strongly believe that WebRTC has a very big potential to change the world and spark a new decentralization revolution. And I want to inspire you to take action and participate in that revolution and help to build the new internet. But you might ask, do we actually need that revolution? Why do we need to build the new internet while, the, while currently it works quite perfectly? Well, to answer this question, we need to get back in time a little bit. In the past, we had a dream of a completely decentralized network, not controllable by any authority, and not prone to censorship, a network where every individual has a freedom to say what they think and what they want. And that network already exists. Today, we know it as modern internet and web. However, this is not the same internet as it was originally. In the past, we didn't depend on large corporations running giant data centers and providing, say, email services. The internet was small and simple. And at first, people ran their own email servers. Then, in the late 90s, there were multiple email service providers. And because it's just not too easy to run your own mail server, right? It's easier to just register on someone else's computer and uh, make it their headache to deal with the administration tasks. And nowadays, our email usage is consolidated uh, around just a few of big providers. And how many people today are running their own email servers? Raise your hands. Well, actually, <laughs> I see just a couple of hands, and it's quite expected. And notice that this is a technical audience. And I think it's sufficiently safe to extrapolate and say that almost no one from the general public uses their own email service now. But the email protocol itself is still inherently federated, decentralized, and open. And many of the original internet protocols were built, were built in that way. UCP, IRC, FTP, HTTP, all of these protocols were uh, created uh, more than 20 years ago with the vision of open internet, of equal peers with equal power. And we had a concept of home pages, which belong to users. And now we have Facebook profiles, which belong to Facebook. It's just that, in the name of convenience, we have sacrificed our privacy and control and handed them over to third parties. And the internet landscape has changed drastically. Now we depend on centralized services to do everyday things. We upload our files to Dropbox to share them. We chat on Facebook. We chat on WhatsApp. And we pay with PayPal. These services are perfect. They're great. They're easy to use. And this approach to technology helped to bring a billion of new users to the internet and will help to bring many more. But at the same time, this approach has a downside. It makes it all even more easier for governments to track uh, all your communications and snoop without many hurdles. And they do that with good intentions, actually. They do that to protect you and children. But I think that it's the wrong direction. Because almost all of our data and almost all of our messages can be read by special government agencies, and we have allowed them to do that. 
And many of us know where this can lead. The government and corporate control and the all-seeing wise big brother who knows for us and better than us what we can read and what we can write, it leads to censorship. And this is not some kind of theoretical problem. Uh, it's uh, our reality already in countries like Turkey, for instance, where they block Wikipedia, or in countries like China, where they have more than 3,000 websites are blocked already. But the problem is actually bigger than that. Our news feeds are currently controlled by Facebook and Google. And the news feed creation algorithm is in a packed black box. And for all we know, it just shows uh, news uh, that are similar to the ones you liked before and hides the news you supposedly won't like. And the algorithm, this algorithm alone has significant power to skew election results, for instance. Or, in simple words, just this. <laughs> well, should it always be like that, though? I think not. We can fight back by creating decentralized apps that are easy to use. And I personally believe that this is critical and crucial because the user experience is just as important as privacy. Because no one wants to use bad apps. And no one wants to use apps that are hard to understand. We have seen that on the example of PGP. And regardless of all technical merits of PGP, it's just too inconvenient for everyday use, right? So we don't even use encryption for our email now. So we need to incentivize users to defy the status quo and go fully decentralized. But how can we do this? I believe that WebRTC can be the answer here. It's already available in Chrome and Firefox on both desktop and mobile platforms. It doesn't need any plugins or any installed software to work. It just works. You open a web page in your web browser, and you can connect directly to other browsers without passing your data through intermediary servers. And WebRTC is getting quite popular lately, but there are still many misconceptions about it. First, there is a common misconception that the WebRTC protocol can be used only for media, it runs for voice, video, and so on. But actually, it can do much more than that. Media is certainly one of the most important applications of WebRTC in the today's web, but it can be used to also to transfer any text or binary data between connected peers. There is another misconception about WebRTC that it's suitable only for the web and can be used only from web browsers. But in fact, you can use it, uh, the protocol from anywhere. And it's a very powerful idea. Because it means that we can create WebRTC applications for desktop or for Internet of Things. And they will be compatible with web browsers, allowing to communicate in both directions. And WebRTC can play a significant role in the recent trend of decentralization or bringing back the internet to its origins. And today we witness a kind of renaissance of decentralized technologies uh, that was started with BitTorrent and Bitcoin. And many millions of people use uh, these technologies every day. And I believe that it's very important because it shows that decentralized networks are possible at scale and they are valuable. So WebRTC can serve as a kind of a bridge to existing peer-to-peer -peer networks and it can help in creating new ones. And the most important thing that you need to know about WebRTC, oops, sorry. The most important thing that you need to know about WebRTC is that it's simple to use. There is a concept that is called data channels. And the data channels provide essentially the same API as WebSocket. So first you just initialize a data channel. And that is a kind of a data stream between two peers. Then you can set a hook to handle incoming messages. And then you can send a message yourself. And that's basically it. You don't need to worry about security of data transfer because when you establish a connection between peers, it automatically initializes the session encryption keys. So data encryption is mandatory in WebRTC, so Mallory 
can't tap into your communications. You just need to make sure that you transfer the session information securely, and you do that with signaling. With signaling, you, um, you exchange the connection information between, peer, between peers, and it is a complex topic, well, worthy of another 30 minutes talk, perhaps, but basically it's just a setup stage when peers choose some point to exchange the connection information, which includes IP addresses and encryption keys. There is a caveat, though. That point of exchange can be considered a single point of failure or some uh, kind of centralization point that defeats the purpose of WebRTC, right? But it's certainly, it certainly can fail, but it's not more centralized than, uh, say, DNS, because DNS can fail too. But if you know an IP address of a server that you want to connect to, you can uh, just use it effectively by passing centralized name servers. And it's basically the same with WebRTC. You can exchange this information out of band. This is, that is, you can just email it or share it in some secure chat or just uh, uh, send it with DHL or snail mail. doesn't matter. When the, your counterpart gets it, you don't need any servers anymore, and you can talk directly. And this part, signaling, is not defined by, by the WebRTC standard, uh, so you have to invert your own way to uh, discover peers. And this gives you a greater freedom in choosing the most efficient way to do that. And that is usually done by uh, using the WebSocket connections, but actually you can just use anything you want. And now that we know the basics, we can try to establish a new WebRTC connection. It is a bit more complicated task because you can build different network topologies. You can just connect two peers between themselves, or you can build complex peer-to-peer -peer networks. And on top of that, the connection process would be a kind of different for each party. There are two sides of the handshake process, the connection initiator and the recipient. On this slide, you see the basics, uh, the basic step required from an initiator. You create an offer, which includes a session encryption key, and set it as a local description. On the other end, when through the signaling channel you get a request to initiate a new connection, you follow almost the same steps. This time, you set the remote description, telling the peer object that someone wants to initiate a new connection. Then you create an answer to the offer and set it through the same signaling channel so that the initiator can get it. And finally, when the initiator gets an answer, it just sets it as a remote description. And that's it. We have established a peer-to-peer -peer connection between two browsers. Now we can probably use that deliciously simple data channel API. Well, never mind, because that's how it would work in some wonderful imaginary world in which we don't live, fortunately. In the real world, we have to deal with another problem. We have to deal with NATS, the cornerstone of peer-to-peer -peer communications. Because the IP version for address space is limited, and because people wanted to feel more secure, Network address translators were invented. And as you know, NATs translate IP addresses from your local network to the global IP addresses. And there is a wide variety of types of NATs. Symmetric NATs, port-restricted NATs, full-count NATs, and so on. And the bad news is that you have to deal with various types of NATs uh, with different techniques. But the good news is that these techniques are pretty well known, and WebRTC takes care of that for us. So all we need to do is to provide known stun servers to gather your public IP address. And then you need to send it along with the rest of connection information through the signaling channel. And basically, stun works just as a mirror. You send a request uh, from your local network, but the stun server sees your translated address. And then it just returns that translated address, and you get it to peers through the signaling channel. There are some cases, though, when that's not completely possible to connect directly, such as when both peers are behind a symmetric net. And the solution here would be a turn. The turn is a kind of a last resort because it basically works as a proxy server. Both peers connect to the turn server, and then it just relays traffic from one peer to another. And obviously, it's a costly solution, and it's not readily available as opposed to stun, uh, for which we have uh, multiple public services. 
running public chain server would be very expensive, but theoretically we can reuse the existing peer-to-peer -peer networks such as Store to um, relay traffic through the existing uh, nodes. But uh, for now, it's not quite possible, so we have to deal with, uh, so we have to set up our own turn server, perhaps. But fortunately, uh, turn is needed only in minority of cases, so usually we don't need to deal with it even. And to make our life simpler, WebRTC uses the ICE protocol, which employs both stun and turn to establish a connection. ICE helps to gather candidates, which are basically can be thought of as pairs of IP addresses and ports. Uh, so we pass these addresses and ports to our peers so that they can connect to us. And actually, there is a great feature in ICE that it also collects your local IP address. So if we are, if we are in a local network and we want to connect to our local peers in our LAN, uh, we don't need to go through the internet connection to do that. And the WebRTC implementation of the ICE protocol allows us to concentrate on the application side because it does everything for us. So we don't need to do much to set up the connection. Basically, what we need to do is to provide the stun and turn server addresses and then set it as an event hook to gather candidates. Then we send that information through the signaling channel. And on the other end, our peers gets that information and calls the add ice candidate function. And essentially, that's almost all we need to do, uh, all we need to know about setting up a basic WebRTC connection. However, what we have seen so far is the most basic topology, because uh, it connects just to peers. Well, it can be seen as a kind of peer-to-peer -peer network as well, but it consists only of two actors. And it's fine for use cases when you just want to connect to peers to have a kind of a chat or something like that, but very often we would need more than that. And for multiple peers, there are many ways to structure your P2P network. You can just create connections between each and every peer, but it won't be the most efficient way to do that because uh, in case of significant traffic, the peers would have to duplicate it for each connection. So uh, if we are aiming for even, say, at, at least 100 peers, the full mesh topology uh, wouldn't be, uh, like, would require too much CPU power and network uh, traffic. To alleviate this, we have a structuring pattern called star topology. And in this case, we choose one or more peers which have the most processing power. These peers serve as a kind of a multiplexer, effectively relaying traffic. So it acts as a proxy again. It works, it's efficient, and Google uses it for their Hangouts implementation, but it has an obvious disadvantage. It's centralized, and now everyone relies on a single point of failure. Fortunately, there are many other alternative ways to structure P2P networks. One of the examples would be onion routing in Tor that builds chains from randomly selected peers. They interlace traffic through the, um, through the build chain, encrypting the data at each step. So it becomes practically impossible to tell whether that traffic was relayed from some other node or if it, if it is the origin of the traffic if it uh, is a original center, so we can know uh, who is the center. Or using distributed hash tables, we can structure networks as binary trees or rings. This is what the Kademli algorithm does. Which, the Kademli algorithm is a, a base for the BitTorrent's DHT implementation. It gives each peer a unique, randomly selected node ID. And each node has its own routing table, so it knows about other nodes, which, is, which in turn know about other nodes themselves. So you can imagine as a kind of a tree. And then when you want to store something on the network, you hash your content, and that will be your key. DHT maps those keys, which are hashes, to node IDs, which can be thought of as hashes as well. So having some content, you would already know on which node you should store it. And you can reach that node by sending a request to a node that from your routing table that is the closest to the node that you're looking for. And then that node 
uh, that is close to you checks its routing table and repeats the steps. That way, in multiple hops, your request will eventually reach the destination and your content will be stored on the network. But while the details of these algorithms are complex, so we'll skip them for now. And for the moment, let's concentrate on BitTorrent. Many of us use BitTorrent to at least once to download Linux ISOs. And at first, the BitTorrent protocol depended on centralized trackers to find the connection info and IP addresses of peers that have certain files. And now with the introduction of DHT, it just needs to find a single peer to bootstrap from, and this is usually done by contacting a well-known node, and then it can continue to work in a decentralized fashion. But again, as with signaling, this is not a point of failure on centralization, because if you know an IP address of at least a single peer, you can join the network. And now, what will happen if we combine BitTorrent with WebRDC? We get WebTorrent. It's basically a BitTorrent implementation in WebRTC terms that can work in browsers. It can't communicate with BitTorrent peers directly because they use different network protocols, and you can't use UDP in WebRTC connections yet, so it's implemented in SCTP terms. So if you want to connect with BitTorrent peers, you would have to go through the proxy road, but we don't actually need uh, BitTorrent peers anyway. We can do a lot of interesting things just like that. WebTorrent simplifies interaction with WebRTC even further and can be a pretty straightforward API. You can send a file or a JavaScript string or a binary buffer, and it will be automatically converted into a torrent file, and that torrent file will be published and announced on the network behind the schemes. And other peers, knowing the torrent hash, can download the file and set it further and the WebTorrent API is very simple. We have seen almost all of it on these slides. It's also available for Node.js as well, so uh, you can use it, the very same API to build server-side apps that can talk to browsers using the WebRTC protocols. And files are actually not limited to those Linux ISOs. Basically, everything can be represented as a file, and there are many practical applications for WebTorrent today. For instance, we can build a distributed GitHub. There is a proof-of-concept project called GitTorrent that is already working. And with that approach, you won't even need to depend on GitHub availability to get your sources, and Git will be truly decentralized. And another application is, that is practical today is content delivery. You can make your website a CDN, and, and visitors will help to uh, distribute your content of your website uh, to other visitors. Or you can even make your website uh, torrent file itself, uh, like represent your website as a bunch of files that will be served by WebTorrent. Actually, there are multiple, possibility, multiple possibilities and ideas. However, WebRTC is an imperfect technology. It still needs to come a long way to support large-scale networks that can replace or improve the current state of web. It's not perfect and has many limitations. The browser support is not perfect, and current modern web browsers, such as Chrome or Firefox, uh, limit the number of connections that you can establish. And this hinders the ability to build DHTs in the web browsers. And for now, it's quite infeasible to implement the uh, Kademlia DHT algorithm on top of WebRTC because of these limitations and because of the handshake overhead. And that means that WebTorrent library currently depends on trackers, so it's sort of centralized for now. Another important issue there is that the browser sessions are short-lived. When you close your tab, you will lose all connections, and the next time you will have to go again through the uh, handshake process and the signaling and so on. This problem kind of can be fixed by allowing to run WebRTC sessions and service workers, so that even if you close your tab, you will still remain connected to your peers. But it's not available today. Unfortunately, that's not um, implemented in the current WebRTC, <coughs> WebRTC standard, but there is a tracking issue in the WebRTC repository on GitHub. 
Another possible solution to that problem of uh, short-lived sessions is hybrid servers. Because as you remember, WebRTC is not limited to browsers only. So we can integrate the WebRTC protocol into existing P2P networks, and other existing peers can serve as uh, intermediaries, meaning they can talk to peers that connect through the WebRTC protocols. Uh, so WebRTC users can be just kind of clients, and the server-side peers can serve as a backbone. And that won't be a centralized network, because uh, the server-side clients are just the same peers. They are only they're not limited by the browser. Still, while there are many uh, problems to overcome, WebRTC is very promising. But peer-to-peer -peer networks have a set of problems of their own. Because these networks are trustless, it's hard to solve the problem of malicious nodes or spam. And if we store content and multiple nodes, we step into the territory of distributed systems, which are very hard to grasp. So, uh, Apart from the problem of spam and malicious nodes, we have to deal with uh, consistency and churn as well. Because what will happen if all nodes that store some file on the network leave all at once? You lose access to that file. And if that file is your Bitcoin wallet for say, it will be very sad to lose it. So for redundancy, we need to make sure to have enough copies of the same file distributed over multiple nodes. And of course, we should not forget about encryption as well, because in trustless networks, basically anyone can read your files. And most importantly, we need to make sure that these nodes are incentivized to stay, meaning that it should be in their interest to share these files as long as possible. And speaking of incentives, I personally think that the economy of P2P networks is not less, not less important than their algorithms, because who would want to share their bandwidth and computer resources if there is nothing for them, right? Bitcoin kind of uh, solved that problem by giving some coins to the nodes that are do mining. So to build large-scale networks, we need to find a way to reward users. And this problem is tricky because it can lead to centralization all over again. Remember that the modern web originally started as a distributed network, but the problem uh, is that economic incentives and the question of who provides the resources lead us to the modern days of giant data centers and mega corporations. You can see it even with Bitcoin, where mining is uh, starting to concentrate around a bunch of uh, giant pools. So we need to find a good way to uh, overcome this, because it would be worth it. We can bring existing P2P networks such as, Store, Bit <coughs> such as Store, Bitcoin, or Ethereum to web by porting them using WebAssembly and adding the WebRTC protocol support. However, that won't be quite possible for now, because UDP and TCP are not directly available in WebRTC yet. However, they might be available in the future. In the meantime, we can build new P2P networks. And there are many, many ways to utilize them for the good of humanity. Because such networks are more secure and resilient, as the example of BitTorrent and Bitcoin shows. It is especially important in such applications as Internet of Things, which is becoming our reality already. And we see that medical devices, self-driving cars, and critical infrastructure already depend on the Internet, which is by and large is controlled by a few of big players now. So I strongly believe that we should not give this mega corporations even more power. And thanks a lot for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Um, so I have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, are there any examples of great WebRTC websites which are purely decentralized apps? Well, uh, this field is currently experimental. And um, the projects that use WebRTC are currently experimental as well, but I can name a few. Probably there are websites that uh, replicate uh, the Spotify or um, Google Music functionality by basically uh, making a, creating a peer-to-peer -peer network where you can share your music with a convenient interface. So it basically 
from the user's experience point of view, it, it's not different from Spotify, but underneath, it uses WebRTC to share the music among peers, so it's, it can be shut down or it can be controlled. Uh, the music is your own, you, and you, you can share your music with your uh, like peers. Uh, well, there are m probably there are many other experimental projects, but I don't uh, quite know about them yet, but we can build them. So that's the point of my talks, to incentivize, to inspire you to build these applications, because there are quite many possibilities to build these apps. We can make internet more secure by, uh, for instance, by replicating the Tor functionality on top of WebRTC and making it uh, like uncensorable and private so that uh, CIA and FBI can't snoop our communications. Awesome. How should we approach dealing with unethical content in a decentralized network since, in, since it's uncensorable? Well, um, that's a tough question because we need to, there are many possible answers to the, this question, and government would certainly want you to, uh, <laughs> to the, that single answer to, is to prohibit the decentralized networks and make all centralized and controllable. But I personally believe that we should take this question out of technical realm and answer it uh, in another way. So probably we need to educate people and just we, we, we can't deal with uh, the content that is questionable without also uh, creating a possibility to censor the content that is not questionable, questionable because in uh, democratic European countries, the questionable content is uh, like we all know what it is. But in some other countries that are not so democratic, um, this uh, questionable content can be, for example, critic of governments or something like that, and they can censor that with the good intentions again. So it's a tough question. So we can't deal with that in a single uh, way. So we have to, probably we have to allow all content on the decentralized networks. We just need to educate people to, like, <laughs> to make them not interested in that questionable content. Mm. Very well put. How would we store data that we need to restore, for example, a Slack conversation when data only flows P2P? Well, if we are if we're speaking about WebRTC in the browser, probably we can store that data through the uh, W3C APIs. We have, um, uh, if I remember correctly, there are new APIs now available in HTML5. HTML5 that allow to store files on your local file system. But apart from that, there is a local storage and session storage that we can use to store uh, the intermediate information, uh, the, the information that would not require to go to the file system to be stored. So like probably, probably messages or emails can be stored in the local store, and we don't need to go to the local net, uh, to the files, local file system. Nice. And uh, the other possible answer is that hybrid scheme. So we can probably create uh, server-side applications that would use the WebRTC protocol. And these server-side applications would talk to the client peers that are working web browsers. So web browsers would just use the infrastructure that is provided by the server-side peers. But again, there is a question of incentives. So what is, what is there for uh, the server-side apps to store your content? It's, uh, it's an open question. Nice. How might you scale this for tons of users all communicating on the network at once? Well, um, the peer-to-peer -peer -peer networks are inherently scalable because the more peers you have, the more users you have in your network, uh, the, more the more efficient it will be because it will be, if you have, say, a million of peers, your content will be scaled all over the globe. So it will be even faster for you to access this content because uh, probably for some popular content, you will be accessing uh, your local nodes that are in your local network or in your country, for instance. So if we replicate content all over the globe, it will be even more efficient than the current infrastructure. But uh, with WebRTC, the problem is that currently web browsers limit the number of connections to 150 or something like that. So we can build decentralized networks at massive scale for, for now. 
But I hopefully, and I hope that this problem will be solved and the browsers will be allowed to uh, connect to more peers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikita. Thank you. Thank you all.